And we are live on 89.7 Contact FM. Definitely time for one-on-one. And this show, for those who are listening to it for the very first time, is a platform to get uh, to discuss constructively on uh, different issues affecting Rwanda. And, of course, we get to host different personalities that shape the news agenda of Rwanda and beyond. My name, as always, is Eugene my guest today is from Transparency <coughs> International Rwanda and she is called Francine Umurunji. She is the Institutional Development and Advocacy Coordinator of Transparency International Rwanda. Welcome to One on One. Thank you, Eugene. Yes. So basically, we will be talking about the mandate of Transparency International Rwanda, the Corruption Perception Index, and, and Rwanda's positioning, plus, of course, the different roles that uh, your institution plays in bringing down or completely eradicating corruption in the Rwandan society. So let's, course, first of all, demystify this feeling or thought that TI Rwanda only deals with issues of corruption. Is this true, that you only handle issues to do with corruption? What is what is the role of Transparency International beyond just looking at the corruption levels of a country? Yes, thank you. We deal, uh, Transparency National Rwanda is an NGO, non-governmental organization that was created in 2004 uh, mm-hmm. with uh, the mission to fight against corruption, promote good governance mm-hmm. uh, through uh, enhancing integrity uh, in the Rwandan community. So we not only deal with corruption because corruption is... It's not easy to just ascertain that a case is a corruption case. So there is an other uh, things behind mm-hmm. uh, before you e- ascertain that a case is a corruption case. So uh, you can't even talk about corruption without talking about good governance. So we deal with good governance. We deal, of course, with corruption and other related offenses. Okay. Yes. So let's talk about the issue of dealing with good governance. At, at what level and, and, and what exactly do you mean by saying we deal with good governance? W- what is your role in dealing with good governance? Because we know that there are different institutions that say they are doing that, like the Rwanda Governance Board, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the minister, ministers and different institutions. So what exactly do you do as TI Rwanda? In, when it comes to issues of, um, uh, uh, you know, governance? Yes, uh, we do a lot of things in issues. We, we operate at a national level. Mm-hmm. Of course, we do, uh, we work with uh, different uh, government institutions at central level, but most of our work is at local level. So we, we have, for example, centers in uh, six districts uh, that deals, and we work very closely with the local government so we do a lot in different sectors. Mm-hmm. Uh, good governance, you know, is cross-cutting all the sectors in education, in uh, justice, in uh, finance, like uh, PFM. We, we do a lot in the public financial management. So we just look at all those sectors and at the same time at the central level and local government level. Mm. So, yes. so the choice of dealing mostly or majorly with people in the grassroots level. Why? What informs that choice? Why do you decide to do that? Is it because it is at that level that corruption is rife or poor governance is rife? No, no, no. no. Uh, probably because most of our clients are just citizens. So, And most of the citizens are... Uh, for example, uh, why our, our information source, for example, to know what case we have to follow. We get it from our project. Is This is the, really the main project that we have that informs us on uh, issues of governance of corruption. Mm. It's a project called ELAC, Advocacy ELAC. Mm. and Legal Advice Center. Mm. We have those in like uh, five, six districts, at least one in each province. We also partner with other organizations that learn what we call AGICS, is uh, anti-corruption justice and information centers. So they operate almost like ALAC. So all those centers operate uh, five days a week and almost all the time. They don't close the doors mm-hmm. for those days. So they receive cases, different complaints from citizens. Mm-hmm. Most of those are from local government. Mm-hmm. That's how we go for local for government. The, for the local government. Yes. But, but we also have, uh, we also deal with uh, 
uh, central because we have other uh, projects like uh, what we call the Integrity Pact. Mm -hmm. And uh, so those deals with uh, public contracts. So what 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 exactly what you say integrity pact mm -hmm. it involves who the, the 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 public servants in the central government with Transparency International or what do you what is, what does it exactly entail Yeah it involves public servants and private sector because there are those two who have deals with a public contract so the public contract are are, are, are given are, are to the to the private to implement so we we meet those two but this, at the same time, we, we, we do it at the local level because there are local districts, uh, rather the districts uh, in local government uh, that provide those contracts. Mm. So we really mostly uh, work with uh, with uh, uh, local government. Mm. Yes. So let's talk numbers then, because when mm -hmm. we look at the Corruption Perception Index, mm -hmm. Rwanda scores very high when it comes to low corruption levels as compared to its its regional neighbors and, and other countries in Africa. And so, which brings to the issue of zero tolerance of cor uh, to corruption. But people have complained and said, yes, we're saying zero tolerance, but the vice is still there. It is mm -hmm. there with us. Mm -hmm. So how realistic is this slogan of zero tolerance to corruption? Looking yes. at your level from Transparency International Rwanda mm -hmm. and, and looking at these kind of scenarios, how would you gauge the reality of that slogan? Yes, I can see. You see, Eugene, we are human. And we can't, in this uh, corruption vis, mm -hmm. in a human being is there, whether you want it or not. So zero tolerance, yes, of course, but it doesn't eradicate completely this vase of uh, being corrupt in human beings. So I can say that the corruption uh, behaviors are still there in Rwandan people, but I can, compare to other countries, especially in the East African community, mm. I think Rwanda is really positioned positioned in a better place does that make us yes. comfortable then uh you know does it make us feel okay it's all right no. since we rank better than the others in the low levels <laughs> no of course no 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 no, mm -hmm. not at all we mm -hmm. can't be comfortable we have to continue fighting because mm -hmm. uh as we find ways of fighting those who are corrupt find other ways of even changing their way of doing so we have to keep on uh, hunting them mm -hmm. so we can't be comfortable for example as you we talked about numbers we we in the corrupt uh, first of all corrup corruption perception index is mm -hmm. not uh, a, a work of transparency national rwanda mm -hmm. it is a work of transparency international mm -hmm. so it ranks countries worldwide uh, for example uh, in 2013 last year Rwanda was ranked 49 mm -hmm. out of 177 countries, 177 countries. Uh, it was positioned at, four, at, uh, at a 49th position and ranked 53 out of 100 uh, worldwide. But in Africa, it came fourth. We want to be first, for example. Or we want even to go f to be first in the world. Mm -hmm. Why not? Mm. And we can do mm. so. That to say that we are not at the point we want to be. We mm. have to keep on keeping on. Yes. <laughs> so looking at, at at that call or dream of being number one with, with the least corrupt country, then what have we done since that report came out? Since that perception index came out, what are the concrete things that have been done? either yes. by Transparency International Rwanda or by your partners in yes. ensuring that this dream is achieved? Uh, I think it is uh, uh, an effort of all the partners involved. Uh, the government, of course, in the forefront, uh, to begin with, they have put in place uh, laws and institutions like the Auditor General Institution. You know how, what he's doing now. He's doing a very great job. Uh, the Ombudsman, uh, the Public Procurement Authority, all those institutions are there to really fight against corruption. Mm -hmm. 
without talking civil society like with us, mm-hmm. that what we do. So there are a lot of effort. But I think it's not only those institutional and legal framework only, but it is the implementation of what is there. There's really zero tolerance. It doesn't mean that there's no corruption at all. There's zero corruption, but there's zero tolerance. It is different. There is zero tolerance, but corruption is still there. Yes. So this case of the corruption is still there. Because when you say that, so are you trying to assert the feeling or the notion or the belief that corruption can never be 100% eliminated? No, no, no. That's not what I say. Uh, But I think as we are human, and the human being is just... Uh, I like once uh, when Tito Rutaremera was still uh, the ombudsman, he said that, I think he was asked that question. Then he said, you know, if that happens, then there won't be any need the police to be there. We will just close the doors for the police, for all those institutions. We just close the doors. Mm. Do you think it will happen? Mm. I I don't think so. You don't because think so. human are human. Mm. You won't have and, and a this, Rwanda where mm. uh, even let me tell you, even the, the, the first thing the, the first country that was ranked uh, least corrupt. Least corrupt it was Denmark. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't a hundred percent as well. That is the first uh, in the world. So maybe but there's, we can there's there's nothing wrong with being over ambitious because yes. there are those who will take advantage of that reasoning that human is too corruption, you know, mm-hmm. and, and then they would say, okay, after all, you know, we are humans. We cannot eliminate this 100. Yes. Why can't we hear more leaders and more, even if it seems unrealistic, mm-hmm. uh, saying it, that, yes, we can do this. We can really have zero. Yes. And we can have the police pack up and go back home and do other jobs and farm but, and not guard against corruption. Yes, that is a dream. And it is good to dream. It is like uh, the... How do you call it again? The the uh, the world we want to see. And maybe one day we'll get to that. But uh, I think it's like, as you know, the human being, mm-hmm. we just have to keep on trying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe one day we'll have that. Okay. Uh, there are countries where you uh, have had, uh, have never been in Singapore. Or, uh, there are countries where they say, that you know, corruption is in a lot of form. You know, there is uh, there is uh, the favoritism. There is the there are a lot of form. And as I say, human being is a human being. You may not give a bribe, you may uh, not give money, but you can be corrupt in a, in a way or another. So that's why I'm thinking that corruption is very complex. Mm-hmm. And human being, as human being. We have that thing uh, that we get tempted. Exactly. All right. So, yes. so, so that brings us to these other very complex uh, form of corruption because most of us have always understood corruption as being giving money and receiving money. But then mm-hmm. there was this uh, 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 type of corruption that was stated a few months ago, mm-hmm. and involves it involves corruption at workplaces yes. where female employees are forced to go to bed with their employers in order mm-hmm. to get you know promoted or get that particular kind of job mm-hmm. so how are you dealing with this area because more focus has been put into the money exchange mm-hmm. leaving out this other form of corruption so what mm-hmm. have you done as an institution to deal with that uh we've done a lot but we have we still have a long way to go uh what we did was first of all we receive cases related to that corruption uh, corruption related, gender related corruption. So we received the, the cases. Then we talked with the institutions concerned to solve the cases, to give uh, rights to the victims, to, to take them in the institution because they were either thrown away or refused some advantages. So first, what we did is to get back the rights of our victims. That's what we did first. Then second, to see if the perpetrators can be followed in law, in, in justice. Uh, but most, we organized some sessions with the parliamentarian for them to know that this is 
are re- real cases that are existing mm. in our society mm. because before it was like no this is a scattered cases one here and another one it's not really a problem in our society but then parliamentarian when we went together in the field with a group of parliamentarian who uh, are in the uh, African parliamentarian network against corruption of the chapter of Rwanda mm-hmm. so we have this network so we work closely together so they get to know what is there and we plan we did a roadmap on how we are going to either because the our law the corruption uh, the the law that fights corruption in Rwanda is not really there's no provision clear provision on that uh, uh, so it has left loopholes yes, for people so, to abuse and get scot free to get away yes. with, with with the cases yes. how could you explain because there is no clear provision on that so uh, it, for example if you come with some testimonies either you have taken photos or you have taken uh, some some uh, recording recording on, exactly the police is not going to accept that really yes why because it is not provided for by the law that by the law that we have how long has this been so from when the law was there so it's meaning not... all these years nothing has been done to correct that part no 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 so now what we were doing is with the parliamentarian to see how the either the law can be revised to include that or maybe do another law that is specifically on that uh, kind of corruption. So you're trying to tell me today if if I went in a meeting undercover mm-hmm. and recorded a planned or a session where mm-hmm. a corrupt deal is being planned mm-hmm. and I recorded it secretly and went to the police, it will not be used no. against the perpetrators? No, it can't. Wow. Yes. It's pretty sad because definitely <laughs> so, sad. so so then let's talk about the whistleblowers then mm-hmm. what do we do with them what does the law say how are they protected because you can have such people mm-hmm. who can come and blow the whistle on a very big corrupt activity that mm-hmm. is either undergoing or is being planned mm-hmm. but then they fear for their lives how are these ones protected under transparency international rwanda is there anything that you do for this kind of you group mean, of people. You mean you mean for the gender uh, corrupt uh, no, any, any any form of corruption. Yes. If I saw anything or I know of a, of a corrupt activity and I come to report mm. without wanting to be known or if they know that I'm the one who has come to report is there a prote- witness protection plan what what yes. kind of plan is there? What we do when somebody doesn't want to reveal their identity, identity mm. we don't do that. What we do is just we 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 of course, some of them do not have enough proof, and it is hard for us to talk on behalf of somebody when you don't have enough proof. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is one of the challenges that we are having. So we, they, they don't want to reveal their identity, and they are not giving enough proof, mm-hmm. then we don't follow the case. It's it ends very, there. It ends there because it's not easy. Unless we have, he, we, they can provide us enough proof that can uh, allow us ourselves to put forward the case what, without what without proof, our what more proof can they provide when an actual recording can be refused as proof as evidence what more proof can they do i mean i'm just trying to portray how probably hard it may seem yes. for people to even report about this mm-hmm. then second part of the whistle blowing part is the reward scheme Yes. Where we've seen in other countries where they've said, okay, for anybody who reports this corrupt activity, blah, 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 there is this reward for, mm. for, for, for doing that. And mm-hmm. then it encourages certain people to say, listen, you're going to eat this money, but there's even a bigger money for me to get if I report you. Mm. Maybe incentive wise, not looking at a way of la- either corrupting people to report corrupt activities, but yes. rewarding the whistleblowers. Yes, but would you advocate for that? Of are we doing we that? Do. Mm-hmm. Of course we do. For example, in Rwanda Revenue, they do. Mm-hmm. When you are not part of it, because most of the time mm-hmm. <laughs> you have to pay, because our law punishes the one who bribes and the one who takes bribe. Mm-hmm. And most of the time, that one who is coming to report, he is most of the time the one who took part 
and got and he's annoyed. Not, yes. Satis- and he's not, not satisfied yes. with the deal. That is the one most mostly who come to report. And as he, as he knows or she knows that she will be also followed mm-hmm. by the law, it's not easy for them to accept to be live, to to be they identity to be revealed or what. Mm-hmm. But uh in Rwanda Revenue, for example, you know that there is a reward. When when you you have seen or you you are you you know about deal those dealings mm-hmm. in the Rwanda revenue and you come to report if you're not part of course you get a reward mm-hmm. and it is there but it doesn't happen to all the cases maybe probably this is something that we can uh when this revision of the law is uh, we've done the roadmap but we have not yet I, I, uh, I'm, I'm interested in the way you react when you say this law. It seems not pessimistic. Are, are you are you pessimistic that are you not optimistic that probably it will be done faster? No, it will uh, take longer. Do we have a timeline of when we will have the amendments, if any? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not pessimistic at all, but you know, it is a lot. We we, we will go into a lot of priorities. Mm-hmm. And we tend to forget other priorities, which are, but we have this in our programs and our our priorities. Uh, I'm not pessimistic at all that it can change. Mm -hmm. I think it is a matter of time. We need to just sit and see if we really need this to be revised Mm -hmm. and where and how, maybe to include all of those. Uh, So I'm not pessimistic at all. all. Talking of the grassroots, it brings mm. me to the question of, you know, the feeling of from where do we or where are we supposed to tackle the issue of corruption? Is it from the top leadership or from the bottom? Where uh, do you think should be the place I think where corruption? Two way. <laughs> two way. Yes. Uh, there is a kind of corruption that uh, uh, at the lower level, this bribe, uh, especially in service delivery. Mm-hmm. And you know, Service delivery is provided at a local level. Central level doesn't provide service delivery mostly. So, and uh, the bigger bribe you find it in the in the service delivery. So, I think the big junk of work is at the local level, but of course uh, the central level also has because. An example, the, the embezzlement that you hear the Auditor General is saying, mm. it's not only in the local level, mm. it's in the central institutions as well. So there is everywhere there is a lot of work to do mm. about uh, So top and bottom. Against, yes. All right. But mostly mm. for you, you think bottom is the most... Uh, depending on yeah. what you want to address, mm-hmm. depending on what you want to address. But corruption is As, corruption. Exactly. Mm. No, 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 no. Of course, corruption is corruption, but there are sectors. Mm-hmm. Yes. And they, uh, you know it is cross-cutting. So if you want to address what we call grand corruption, then you go at the central because you won't have a petty corruption at the local, at the grand, uh, at, the, at the central level institutions. Mm-hmm. If it's really grand, grand corruption, then you go. For the top, uh, yes, guys. but if it's bribe and and this bribe, uh, because it is really in the in the I think when it happens, we have seen that for a, a citizen who doesn't want even much, if you take like uh, a hundred or even let's say a thousand, mm. it is like taking the whole of his life, mm. you see, that that means even more. Uh, I'm not saying that the grand corruption is less. Mm, mm. <laughs> it doesn't mean a lot. Mm. It means a, a lot as well. If for the economy. For the economy, uh, 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 yes. Yes. So mm. this then brings us to the issue of, um, you know, when I was thinking about this, I was like, okay, fine. But uh, uh, we are saying that, uh, you know, corruption uh, starts f- with us and, and, and ends, ends again with us. But then looking at the issue of the government, uh, mm. let's talk of the government part. And for you as Transparency International Rwanda, what then do you think or what are your recommendations to the central government in order to make its affairs even more transparent, you know, when it comes to budget, uh, budgeting, when it comes to procurement and other government activities? What are the areas that you as an institution see that the government needs to improve on in order to be more transparent with the public? Okay, um most of the issues that come up when you talk that about that it is 
uh, the human uh, capacity, the human resource capacity, the employment of the employment of, of public servants. Yes, mm -hmm. their skills, their numbers, uh, because they deal with a lot of things at the same time, which doesn't allow to probably make citizens participate. They have deadlines. They have a lot of things. That is what you will often hear from them, that this is why we are not really delivering May. So I think probably we know that the government is is not uh, probably at the level of employing as much as people as are uh, wanted to really handle all the work that is in different institutions mm -hmm. to deliver. So I think that is the first challenge they have. Mm -hmm. As soon as they employ enough, they uh, train them so that they are skilled enough, then I think there's no, there won't be any excuse of saying that. Mm -hmm. Because most of the time, when when they are mal like uh, uh something that is not going on well. They say, you know, it's because of the time, uh, no skills, and so on and so forth. So I think that is the first thing to address. So the government has to address the issue of uh, hiring and retaining uh, their, 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 their personnel. And so in final, in conclusion, there are those who have sometimes accused institutions like yours and others like the human rights, the ones that deal with the human rights issues as not being independent, mm -hmm. you know, as, as, as having interference with government, as, as sometimes being told what to do and, and what not to do. How independent is your institution? Do you get any interference and at what level? And how can you justify that answer? Not at all. Mm -hmm. Who is saying that? You know, I've never heard. There are several people <laughs> who have accused. Those yes. who write reports yes. about Rwanda, like the okay. human rights issues, okay. they always say, you know, mm. human rights bodies in Rwanda are pro-government. Mm. Mm. And so Transparency International Rwanda has to talk about issues of transparency and accountability. And maybe there are those who will accuse the institution of not being yes. transparent. Maybe, I don't know. I have not heard much, but mm -hmm. I think, you see... Uh, like those international organizations like human rights or whatever, they think that being a civil society or a non-government organization, you have just to oppose the government. Mm -hmm. That's what I believe. Mm -hmm. So if for us, what we don't, we see, which is not good, we say it. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is good, we say it. We can't, we can't see the good thing that the government is doing and we just... Keep quiet. Keep quiet. Mm -hmm. It's not right. You can't say the bad thing and hide the good thing. Mm -hmm. You have to recognize the, the good thing that is being done and then show what is wrong and maybe uh, show your recommendations, what you think should be done mm -hmm. to correct the mistakes that is that are being done. So if we do, we, we just put... Uh, forward what is our government is doing right. Mm. So they may think that we are... pro-government. No, we are not okay. at all because all right. we can't hide it if okay. it is good. Yes. yes. Francine, I need to end at this particular point. Thank you so much for being with us on One on One. Thank you so much, Eugene. All right. Thank you. Right. There you go. There you have it. Uh, Francine Umurunji, Institutional Development and Advocacy Coordinator at Transparency International Rwanda. My guest today on One on One. More of such kind of interviews right here on 89.7 Contact FM from me and all the crew that made this program a success. Goodbye for now.